Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Gyeongnam Provincial Government for inviting me to make this presentation. My name is Sean Sweeney. I direct the International Programme for Labour, Climate and Environment at the School of Labour and Urban Studies at the City University of New York. And I also coordinate Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, or CHUED. The title of my presentation is Energy Democracy as a Means to Advance a Green New Deal and a Just Transition. My comments will mostly address what unions active in the network understand as energy democracy, particularly as it pertains to electricity and the need to respond to the threat of climate change. Unfortunately, my comments may not be, perf uh, per be a perfect fit for this forum, I'm sure you will have heard a lot about good practices of citizen participation, decentralization, deliberative democracy, and so on, as well as democratic local economy. But when it comes to energy, we have to take a whole economy approach, and that means changes must take place at the level of national systems. This does not rule out local democracy or citizen participation, but the changes needed cannot be driven by local actions or a bottom-up approach. I will argue that full public control of energy is essential in order to achieve both the social goals of the Green New Deal and to help ensure a just transition. But it is also necessary if humanity is to have any chance of meeting the emissions reductions targets adopted under the Paris Climate Agreement. But this vision of public energy is not the same as it, it was in the past. However, the vision is also quite different from the ideas of energy citizenship or community energy that have emerged in recent years. More on this subject later. The proposal for a Green New Deal first emerged as a response to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its report, special report on 1.5 degrees, that was released in October 2018. In the report, the IPCC stated that human caused CO2 will have to fall by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030 in order to stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold adopted in Paris. You can see there a picture of uh, US Congresswoman Anastasia Ocasio Cortez. She's the youngest representative in the US Congress, and she sparked the movement for a Green New Deal. She proposed that reaching climate targets is a civilizational priority and should be pursued in ways that can address long-standing social, racial, and economic injustices. The Green New Deal also acknowledged the need for a just transition for workers in energy-intensive industries like coal and gas. The Green New Deal has its critics and its supporters. I am a supporter, but several questions need to be addressed. First, how can emissions be reduced so quickly? Are ambitious climate targets enough? And how exactly can rapid decarbonization be tied to the social justice goals of the Green New Deal, including a just transition for workers? And what role is there for grassroots action and democratic participation? These are important questions, but any attempt to answer them will need to be aware of three fundamental realities. These realities concern the current energy system and where things are going, the challenges of decarbonization, some of which are technical, and the policy failures that are today impossible to ignore. So let's start with the first reality. And it is this, the transition to a low carbon energy system is not happening. I feel the need to say this, because many, including Al Gore, whose picture you see on your screen, the former Vice President of the United States, actually believe that the energy transition is underway, so that all we need to do is demand more ambition and more political will from our leaders so that the transition happens more quickly. Newspaper headlines may say the world is moving away from fossil fuels, but this is not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Some basic facts. Energy accounts for 75% of greenhouse gas emissions and the electricity sector is the leading single source of emissions globally, not far behind our transport systems. These are almost 100% fueled by oil-based products, petroleum, diesel, kerosene, and with road transport making the largest contribution to transport share of emissions. 
Roughly 90 million new cars and trucks are sold every year. And just 1% of those cars and trucks are electric or hybrid vehicles. Then there is buildings, food and agriculture, and also deforestation and land use changes, all of which make a major contribution to emissions levels and global warming. If we look at this chart that's on your screen or about to be put on your screen, you'll see this is world consumption of energy. It shows global energy consumption, which is rising. What you'll see, of course, is the use of coal, oil and gas is rising alongside energy use. Now let's look at electricity. Before the pandemic, global demand for electricity was growing by about 3% a year. During the last 20 years, electricity consumption has risen 70%. You can see in this image the growth in electricity consumption. But if we look at the fuels used to generate the electricity, coal and gas today amount to 61%. And this is higher than, than it was in the year 2000. But now there is 70% more coal and gas being burned today than there was 20 years ago when climate change began to be considered a serious threat. But what about renewable energy? So-called modern renewable energy, primarily wind and solar power, has grown impressively. From 2017 to 2019, 170 gigawatts of capacity was added in each of those three years. That's comparable to about 230 average size coal-fired power stations. However, as you can see in the chart, the growth of renewables in the power sector has not stopped the rise in fossil fuel use. Wind and solar provided just 5% of total electricity consumed at the end of 2016. In this chart, you can see that if you look at total energy consumption, wind and solar amounts to just 2% of the total. So what about emissions? Because energy use is growing, emissions are rising. In fact, CO2 emissions hit record levels in 2018. This year, 2020, we will see a decline in the use of both fossil fuels and emissions as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But this will probably not help much. Within a year or two, energy use could be back to 2019 levels and emissions will resume their upward direction. These facts, rising energy use, rising emissions, and limited growth of renewable energy cannot be ignored. What is happening globally then is not an energy transition towards renewable or sustainable energy. What we're seeing instead is an energy expansion. All forms of energy are growing, coal, gas, oil, nuclear, and renewable energy. The second reality, concerns the science and the technical challenges posed by the need to reduce emissions quickly. As a result of the economic fallout from COVID-19, emissions are expected to decline by 8.5% in 2020. Got to get the job. <laughs> but according to research sponsored by the Dutch government, the emissions reductions brought about by COVID-19 would need to occur every year from 2021 until 2050 in order to be the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. Excuse my cat. Clearly, unless something changes at the level of global politics, these reductions are impossible to achieve. But let me focus for a moment on some of the technical challenges. The International Energy Agency has talked about the need for an energy transition of exceptional scope, depth, and speed. This will require what they call revolutionary changes in energy systems. But we have seen there, are no, there is no energy transition taking place right now. The revolutionary changes that are needed concerns what has been called the electrification of everything. Transportation, heating and cooling of buildings and so on must all be powered by renewable or zero carbon energy. In fact, almost everything that today depends on burning coal, oil and gas must somehow be electrified, but also decarbonized. So where will all this clean electricity come from? And it's important to remember more than 1 billion people on earth have no electricity at all. The neoliberal consensus maintains that markets will take care of this because there will be so many opportunities for investors and businesses uh, in low carbon solutions 
that there is no need for government interventions. And where business opportunities are less obvious, governments can use various policies to incentivize low carbon solutions. This, of course, is a neoliberal fantasy. This brings me to the third reality. The neoliberal approach to energy transition has been a monumental failure. In the early 1980s and 1990s, when scientists were drawing attention to the alarming changes in the climate, the world was in a grip of a policy pandemic. Anti-public and pro-market ideas had fully taken hold and infected many of the major institutions. Everywhere, public services were targeted, not least by the World Bank and the IMF for privatization. It's not surprising, therefore, that the task of saving the planet became inseparable from the push to privatize state-owned or regulated energy companies and to liberalize energy markets. This is still the dominant narrative when the claims that public energy systems are preventing the transition to a low carbon future. In 2006, the UK government published the Economics of Climate Change, the Stern Review. And you can see the picture there of the main author, Sir Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank. Stern suggested taking action on climate change would open up a new period of protracted economic expansion, green growth. Green growth would ensure that global, global GDP growth would eventually be decoupled from rising emissions. Neoliberal policy focused on business opportunities, but it also promoted the idea of the polluter pays principle. According to Stern, the science tells us that greenhouse gas emissions are an externality. And I'm quoting him now. When people do not pay for the consequences of their actions, we have market failure. This is the greatest market failure the world has seen. Unquote. Policy must therefore correct the market failure by putting a price on emissions, either through government auctioning of pollution permits, emissions trading schemes, or by way of a direct carbon tax. This has been a major policy disaster. The World Bank reports that after 20 years of promoting carbon pricing, barely 16% of global emissions are subjected to a price. According to the Global Commission on Economy and Climate, even where emissions are priced, the prices are, quote, still too low to have any meaningful impact, unquote. Put simply, carbon pricing is simply not happening at the global level and it's not going to happen anytime soon. Similarly, policies designed to mobilize the private sector and bring low carbon solutions to market have fallen dramatically short of what is required. Levels of investment remain far too low to drive the energy transition. The International Energy Agency noted recently, renewables generally do not offer opportunities that investors are looking for. Market and policy signals were, in 2019, not leading to a large-scale reallocation of capital to support clean energy transitions. Excuse me. These three realities, rising use of fossil fuels and emissions, the challenge of reducing emissions within such a short time frame, and the failure of neoliberal climate policy puts the discussion on the Green New Deal and just transition into perspective. So where now? Together, these realities point to the need for a radical policy shift. The energy for profit neoliberal approach must give way to a global public goods framework, which must take its place. The global public goods framework is based on two deeply interconnected principles. The first principle is this, emissions generated anywhere in the world are harmful to people everywhere in the world. And the second principle is that cutting emissions anywhere benefits people everywhere. These two principles recognize that all of humanity, all living things live under one fragile atmosphere as part of a multiple delicately balanced systems, ecosystems. The global institutions must be compelled to adopt this approach. Every climate protest, every trade union resolution, every statement by generally progressive political forces should echo this demand. What would this policy shift mean? 
First of all, moving to a public goods approach will not produce miraculous outcomes, but it will allow for decisions to be made on the basis of social and ecological value and not on the basis of returns on investment. It could allow for technical knowledge and promising technologies to become part of the human commons, shared by all, whereas now both are shaped by market criteria and the motive of profit. It would reinstate the importance of planning and cooperation, which is absolutely necessary in order to overcome the technical challenges associated with decarbonization of energy supply and a radical reduction in energy demand. To accomplish these tasks, popular participation of all levels of decision making will be essential. Such a policy shift must first involve the reclaiming of energy systems to public ownership and control. Mission impossible, perhaps, but it is worth remembering that most of the world's electricity systems were set up to create value across the economy, including the creation of human capital by improved health and education indicators, and also raising the productivity of labor. Most of the world's electrical systems were set up knowing that electricity should not be treated as a commodity in order to simply make profit. This image is of the Green New Deal in the 1930s in the United States, where there was no electricity at all in rural areas. And in within 20 years, it was fully electrified through a publicly led nonprofit system based on a global, uh, based on a public goods model. Let me now focus attention on what might be meant by public control of energy and a public goods vision of energy democracy. Many environmental groups, especially in the global north, believe energy democracy can be realized through individual energy generation, community energy projects, and cooperatives of various kinds. It is claimed that these initiatives are people-driven, grassroots, and thus more democratic. It is believed that these initiatives currently pose a major challenge to the large energy corporations, many of whom are happy to continue to use coal, gas, and nuclear energy. This view is fundamentally false. I don't have time to explain why it, why it is false, but I would like, you, like to refer you to a Chewip's most recent working paper, paper title, and you can see it there in your own language, but it's the transition in trouble, the rise, of community, rise and fall of community energy in Europe. On an economic level, individual and community-based energy generation are not viable and depend on public subsidies. Subsidies that are not progressive because they favor property owners and farmers with the land. Until now, these subsidies have mostly been financed by increases in electricity prices, increases that hurt working class and poor people that don't own property. On a technical level, the capacity of individual community and community generation to meet energy needs and to seriously contribute to meeting decarbonization goals is extremely limited. I will now try to attempt to summarize the two-ed perspective on energy democracy. This perspective can be expressed by way of several pro programmatic principles and commitments. If implemented, these changes can open up a new era for reformed public energy companies that serve the public good and take leadership in driving decarbonization. The first point, no further privatizations. Keep public energy in public hands, reform public entities. Defenders of public energy often find themselves in the position of having to defend corrupt and unaccountable public entities. But these problems are not intrinsic to publicness. Many private corporations and financial operations are corrupt and unaccountable. The solution to these problems is not privatization, when often the same top executives stay in charge but earn far larger salaries. Rather, the solution is to reform these entities so they again serve the public good. And serving the public good must today include developing clear plans for an energy transition that can advance decarbonization. The privatization or marketization of public energy systems and the liberalization of electricity markets is the enemy, not the friend of decarbonization. Neoliberal policy has turned electricity into a commodity. It has systematically undermined the idea of electricity as a public service. The more a company sells, the larger its revenue stream. 
There is no room in this framework for radical energy efficiency or conservation, without which climate targets will not be reached. There is no means to cover system costs associated with the need for upgrading electricity grids. The second principle, demarketize public systems, reclaim what has been privatized. Marketization occurs when a public company is forced by law to become a competitor in liberalized energy markets. Its mission then changes from providing a universal service to generating returns to private investors. In other words, a company may be wholly owned or majority owned by government while still being compelled to act like a for-profit private corporation. Reclaiming energy to public control involves renationalizing privatized systems and reforming public companies that were not privatized. So-called competitive wholesale markets should be abolished. This will allow energy companies to pivot away from the imperative of selling ever more electricity and maintaining market share to generate profit. These companies can be mandated to lead the decarbonization process and build genuine democratic partition participation at all levels of the system. Reformed national and regional utilities are finding the means to facilitate the meaningful involvement of municipal authorities and local governments. Promotion of energy efficiency and conservation as a public good. The IPCC, the International Energy, energy Agency and others acknowledge that energy efficiency could potentially contribute up to 40% of the reductions in energy related emissions required by 2050. But the IEA itself notes, quote, future projections reveal that under existing policies, the vast majority of economically viable energy efficiency investments will remain unrealized, unquote. This cannot continue. Energy conservation within a public goods framework can create a large number of socially useful jobs and help us reach climate targets. A just transition needs public investment. Electricity markets are saturated in investor risk, which means governments must guarantee profits for private investors by way of power purchase agreements and similar measures. This is more expensive than having governments invest in new energy capacity directly. And because near all, nearly all renewable energy is subsidized and protected from market competition, many utilities find themselves in a death spiral, losing market share and starved of the investment needed to either sustain or upgrade energy grids. This has led to an investment crisis across the entire, energy, entire system at a time when more investment is needed to meet climate targets. Reinstate facts-based planning and consultation. Decarbonization presents many technical challenges. Modern renewable energy, wind and solar are variable sources of power. At the moment, they require backup in the form of coal, gas and nuclear generation in order to provide electricity during the nighttime and during periods when the sun does not shine and the wind does not blow. Variability is a serious challenge. Overcoming these challenges, and it may not be possible to overcome them quickly, requires energy planning, government investment, and a shift towards energy conservation. My last point, democracy at all levels, a social contract uh, and commitment to local engagement. Adequately funded, reformed, and transparent public companies can provide a solid platform for democratic and popular participation at all levels of decision making. This participation can be anchored in a broad social consensus or a social contract that is tied to intergenerational solidarity and an awareness that we have a common interest, and that is to protect the ecosystems that sustain life and to live within planetary limits. I thank you again for this opportunity. I'm sorry if my cat got in the video, but we'll stop now and I hope to see you all one day soon in Korea. Good luck. Thank you. Bye.